optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I answer your personal question? Now we're just seeing a perfect time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. This episode is brought to you by ShipStation. If you've ever sold anything online or if you sell anything online, then you know what a pain in the ass the shipping process is. It's time consuming, it's expensive, you're always copying and pasting orders from different sites, trying to figure out the best carrier, so on and so forth. It's such a hassle. And in a previous life, I shipped tens of thousands of units overseas, domestically, overnight, ground, every possible carrier, it drove me bonkers. ShipStation was created to make your life easier. I wish I had had it when I was in the biz, so to speak. It has the most five-star reviews of any shipping software. 4.9 out of 5 for Magento users, 4.8 out of 5 for Shopify users, 4.5 out of 5 for big commerce users. It goes on and on. Whether you're selling on eBay, Amazon, Shopify, or more than 100 other popular selling channels, ShipStation lets you access all of your orders from one simple dashboard. ShipStation works with all of the major shipping carriers locally and globally, including FedEx, UPS, and the major local couriers like USPS. ShipStation will recommend the best carrier for your needs so that you know that you're always getting the best deal. They even offer discounts on shipping costs that are available to, say, you as a one-person shop that would normally be thought of as reserved for large Fortune 500 companies. So there are a lot of benefits. No other shipping platform makes shipping faster, easier, and more affordable. And right now, Tim Ferriss Show listeners get to try ShipStation free for 60 days when you use promo code TIM. It's risk-free. You can start your free trial without even entering your credit card info. Just visit ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in TIM, T-I-M. That's ShipStation.com, enter promo code TIM. Check it out, ShipStation.com, promo code TIM. This episode is brought to you by Ring. This season can be a whirlwind of deliveries, visitors, and holiday travel, so it's the best time of the year to upgrade your doorbell and keep an eye on home, no matter where the holidays take you. I'm traveling a ton, and this is key for me. Ring helps you stay connected to your home from anywhere, so if there's a package delivery or a surprise visitor, you'll get an alert and be able to see, hear, and speak to them all from your phone. If you're on the go this season, whether it's across town or across the country, you can check in anytime for some much-needed holiday peace of mind. I've personally personally used Ring for years now. It catches and records all the regular stuff, like deliveries and so on, but it's also saved my ass a few times catching weirdos and weird things. Ring is key to my peace of mind. And as a listener of The Tim Ferriss Show, that's you, you have a special holiday offer on a Ring Welcome Kit available right now. With the Ring Video Doorbell 2 and Chime Pro, the Ring Welcome Kit has everything you need to keep an eye on home no matter what this holiday season brings. With Ring, you're always home. Just go to ring.com forward slash Tim. That's ring.com forward slash Tim. Check it out. Additional terms may apply. And this offer is for U.S. residents only. That is ring.com forward slash Tim. Well, hello, boys and girls, ladies and germs, monks and monkfish. Welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show. This is your host. I don't think I've ever said that before. Tim Ferriss. And it is my job every episode to attempt, do my best, to deconstruct world-class performers from different fields of all different types to find out what their routines are, what their self-talk is like, what types of tools they use, and so on and so forth. My guest today is Gary Keller. This is a name that's come up a lot in the last few years in my friend circles, and particularly since moving to Austin. Gary is the co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Keller Williams, also known as KW, the world's largest real estate franchise by agent count. In 2019, KW, which also ranks number one in units and sales volume in the U.S., was named by Fast Company the most innovative company in real estate. In 2015, Keller began driving KW's evolution into a technology company, now focused on building the real estate platform that agents, buyers, and sellers prefer. He is competing, you may note, head-to-head with multi-billion dollar venture-backed companies The difference, among many, 
so I should say one of many differences, is that he's using his own money, which I just love. <laughs> Keller is also the best-selling author of The One Thing, subtitled The Surprisingly Simple Truth Behind Extraordinary Results. We talk about this quite a bit in our conversation. The Millionaire Real Estate Agent, The Millionaire Real Estate Investor, and Shift. You can find him on Facebook, at Gary Keller. And you can also find his new podcast, which is called Think Like a CEO on all of your podcast platforms. Think Like a CEO, which he hosts with Jay Papazan, is described thusly on Apple Podcasts. Think Like a CEO weaves a narrative of the business and life lessons, including developing business strategies, hiring the right people, and developing a culture that truly puts people first. You can find it, as I mentioned, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you typically find your podcast. Now, without further ado, please enjoy my wide-ranging conversation with Gary Keller. Gary, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tim. Happy to be here. I have heard your name dozens, hundreds maybe of times uh, hmm. since moving to Austin and certainly heard the name many times before that. Uh, and th that relates to uh, much of your work in the written word. And I think we'll get to that. But I wanted to start with something I came across in doing research for this conversation. And feel free to fact check because you don't want to believe everything you read on the internet, of course. <laughs> but uh, uh, I want to talk about your childhood a little bit and maybe your later childhood. Sure. So it, sure. it seems like it was the summer before your junior year that your dad had you shadow appointments with a banker, an attorney, and a realtor. And then and a lawyer. And a lawyer. Yeah, a lawyer. Yeah, no, you said it right. Accountant and a lawyer and a banker and a realtor. Got there it. There were four of them. Four mm -hmm. of them. Yep. And so I'd like to talk about that, if you, if you took anything in particular away from that, and also a quote from your dad, which was, or in effect, uh, when he passed on to you, he, he, he said that anyone he knew who had any money either made it in real estate or put it in real estate. So could you talk about that period of time and what's, yeah. what impact that had on you? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I thought I would actually in high school, I thought I was going to be a rock musician and I gave no thought to college whatsoever. And the uh, summer after I graduated from high school, I um, came home one night after our band had performed and my mother and dad, who were both educators, were waiting up for me. A little spooky, right? To turn the lights on and they were my parents <laughs> in the dark sitting there in the den. But uh, I just plopped down on the couch, Tim, and I, and I, and I said, you know, I don't think it's going to work out. I... I'm not that good, and I'm not motivated to practice enough to overcome that I'm not any good. And my and my parents just looked at me, and I think they knew that, by the way. And both being educators, um, my dad said, well, we actually applied to a college, and you were accepted if you'd like to go. And I, I said, <laughs> really, where? And they said, Baylor University. I went, cool. I'd been there once because I had an older sister who had just started going there. And uh, – so that was kind of it. So my, my, uh, that's how, that's how I got to college. And, um, the, at the end of my sophomore year, beginning of my junior year, that summer, my dad, um, uh, I, he said, you probably should get a major. <laughs> and I went, okay, I, I, you know, I hadn't given any thought. And, um, I love, and I love to tell a story to the kids when I teach, because I said, maybe you can relate to the fact that I was clueless about everything. And um, so dad said, well, um, why don't I set you up to uh, spend some time with some guys? So it was an accountant, a banker, a lawyer, and a realtor. And the, um, I liked the realtor, Tim, and I liked it. I liked it because it was entrepreneurial. It was very people-oriented. He didn't have a tie on. Uh, he, didn't, he wasn't in a stuffy, corporate-feeling environment. Um, right. All those, all those sound reasons why you should choose a profession. Right. Uh, but, uh, anyway, that appealed to me, got back to college, uh, thinking, you know, real estate and what that guy did was something that was very appealing to me. And Baylor university had just announced they were launching that semester of my junior year, first semester, a real estate degree program. And it was in real estate and insurance. So that's kind of, so I, so I, I, I signed up and, uh, you know, the rest is kind of history. So I got my degree in, in real estate and came out, interviewed a couple of places and landed in Austin. Let's, let's talk about, and this is maybe one of those places, uh, New York life for a second, because I, 
I would assume, and again, this is a dangerous business assuming things, but that you are a spectacularly good at selling or at least persuading, <laughs> uh, conveying ideas. And my understanding is that you're put through some type of assessment. Uh, mm -hmm. could you, yeah, what happened? Yeah, that was my, that was in college and, uh, my senior year, my degree plan was in the marketing department and it was real estate and insurance. So, um, you know, the college, they don't, they don't teach you uh, much of anything about leaving the, the college other than teaching you how to interview. So one of the guys that came on campus was with New York Life. And I didn't realize, I later discovered that that guy, I thought I was interviewing with New York Life, the corporation, but I actually was interviewing with the, the top New York Life salesperson in the area. <laughs> and um, so anyway, so I went to the interview and uh, they gave me a behavioral profile assessment. And I got a what felt like a form letter uh, a couple of weeks later that said I didn't match the profile of their successful salespeople. And so I would not be made an offer to join them. And the funny thing is I was so mad about that that I chose real estate. <laughs> <laughs> I was furious. I mean, you know, I have a degree, right? I have a degree in real estate and insurance. I go to interview for my job and they tell me I'm not – I don't have the, the, the job match requirements it's almost like right, you got a, a degree in law or whatever, and then when you got out, the law firms all told you you're really not a good match to be a lawyer. It was kind of a, it was kind of a, you know, freaked me out a little bit, right? But I, I tended to to respond pretty strong to that kind of stuff. So I got really mad, and, and I just interviewed real estate companies. <laughs> and and, and uh, when did you strike out on your own? How did that? Uh, how was that catalyzed? Well, that was in uh, '83. So when I got out of when I got out of college and interviewed, I interviewed two firms. I chose the one in Austin, Texas, um, and had been here I think maybe once or twice before with my family. But it, I drove here and uh, interviewed with the firm, liked them, agreed to go to work there, and um, start literally, you know, launched launched my my career, if you will, through. Um, uh, I guess that would be after the end of the summer. Yeah, it'd be in the summer. Yeah, so it did that, and um, by the I sold I sold six houses my first thirty days in a city that I'd only been in a couple of times before because I'm I kind of believe in business by the book a little bit. You know, my my one of the things that and I don't know where this came from, Tim, but um, I, I had a well I had a professor make a profound statement once, and he said, Mr. Keller, he says, <laughs> people have lived before you. You you might want to study what they know before you go out and start doing your thing. And that, that, that makes, that makes a lot of sense to me. Right. So, uh, I studied how, while I was still in college, I was reading the books and studying how to be a successful realtor. So when I hit the ground, uh, in a, in a city that I knew, you know, maybe two people in, uh, I just did everything by the book, sold six houses, closed five of them, got my picture in the paper. Woohoo! What do you but mean just, by the book in that case? Well, meaning, meaning that, uh, that, I went to I went to the books. I went to the books of the best real estate um, trainers at that time. I see. This, the, and I, by the book meaning following the playbook of the people at the time mm -hmm. who were well respected. It, 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 exactly. And I, 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 that's exactly what I did. So I outlined all of that, created a, a plan for myself, and then just executed on the plan. And um, and things went well. the The funny thing is, is at the end of my I guess it was the uh, end of the 11th month of my first full year, calendar year. My manager came in and said, um, you're going to be the rookie of the year. You know, you're, you're, you're 22 years old. This is, or, yeah, not 23. This is amazing. It's awesome. And I went, no, nah, I'm out of here. And she goes, what do you mean? I'm, I'm, I'm saying, well, I hit all my goals. I made the amount of money that I wanted to make, bought a condo, got a dog, uh, got a new car, got some Sir Wynn Vega tower speakers that were like four feet tall. And, you know, and so I'm done. I'm going to go take a month off. So I, I, I left. Anyway, came back and I discovered that I was really kind of a closet trainer, meaning that I was over there helping people. And I've been in the business a year, year and a half. I'm helping people. And um, I think I just came by that naturally, Tim. So long story short, I ended up applying for a, a management position in the largest firm in the city at the time. And the owner said, uh, I am not going to hire you. 
Why not? Once, well, once again, I'm getting rejected, right? Um, he said no one liked me. And, <laughs> and you know, I, the truth is, is, is that's probably correct. But, but here's what I said to him, and I remember it as clear as day. I said, I understand that, but I come into the office, and the receptionist is doing her nails, and I have, I have clients coming in. And silly me, I thought the environment was supposed to you know, support my goals. So I ask her to put it away and she gets mad at me. And then I go around the corner and there are agents and they've got all their smelly food out and it's a mess and it's right by the reception area. And I, I ask them to clean it up or, you know, put it away or something because silly me, I thought the environment was supposed to support me and they don't like me doing that. But I said, if you hire me, um, they'll like me and we'll all make more money. And he said, I'm not hiring you. And I don't know where, the, and I don't know where this came from, you know, it's, it, you know, but somewhere deep inside that was offensive to me. And so I said, well, give me a test. If I pass it, you have to hire me. And I, I don't think anyone ever talked to this multimillionaire, you know, <laughs> businessman. And so he actually got a sheet of paper out. He wrote down the things that I need to accomplish, handed it to me and said, go do it. And I had no training in what he'd asked me to do. And, and, and I had no support. Right. I wasn't getting paid for it. I was just entrepreneurially uh, going to go out and achieve this list to get a job. Well, I think he blew me off and forgot about it. I don't know. What but, were some uh, of the things on the list? Well, it was things like uh, go recruit people to the firm. Uh, right. But here I am, a salesperson with no training in that. Right. And then the other one was teach and we'll see what your ratings will be like. It was just a series of, of hurdles that I was, I was told to go do. And I did. My first recruit was actually out of a bookstore. I was in the B. Dalton bookstore and I saw a woman that was looking at the real estate section and I went over and said, can I help you? <laughs> and, uh, and she <laughs> goes, no. And, and I, I was taken back, right? I said, I'm so sorry. And I walked away. And a little while later, she came over to me and she said, Hey, you know, I, I won't apologize. I, I thought you were trying to pick me up or something. And I said, well, because I'm a smart aleck, Tim. I said, well, the thought crossed my mind. Uh, but I said, no, I said, I actually have a degree in real estate. I sell real estate. Uh, and I, I love learning. And I've, I've literally read or browsed almost every book on these shelves regarding real estate. So I thought I could just help you. And she said, well, I'm thinking about getting in real estate. And so <laughs> that was one of the things on my list I had to go accomplish. Right. So um, check that off the box. And uh, it's really cool when we later started our firm, she was one of the, the first 20 agents to, to come join us. But so that was it. So that, that what what essentially uh, I then did that for uh, about a year and a half to two years. Well, it was, it was easily two years now that I think about it. Um, and they they um, the company did something that, that I didn't like. And I went in to resign uh, because the owner had promised me when he hired me. He sent me to the goat pastures outside of Austin. They call it Round Rock now, but it was goat pasture. And he didn't give me where all the growth was going because he'd already hired a manager for that, he said. Well, turns out that um, the, he hired three managers and none of them could ever launch that office. And he just had to eat the lease for three years before he could get out of it. Me, on the other hand, went up to Round Rock, Georgetown and built a business that's still there today. It's hugely successful. But he didn't. he then did something that created uh, a problem in my office. So I went in the, I went in one morning at like 6.30 and said, I, I quit. I said, I'm going to go back. I'm going to build it back after you tore it down, and then I'm out of here. Now the table's reversed, though, Tim, and, and the, this owner says, well, what would it take to keep you? And I just thought that was, wow, full circle, if you will, right? <laughs> no one likes you, and I'm not hiring you to what will it take to keep you? So I wrote a number on a sheet of paper, and it it was the largest sum that he'd ever guaranteed anybody. And uh, he, he agreed. <laughs> he said, okay. <laughs> How did you come up with the number? Did you uh, already have it in your mind before you walked into no, the office? No, I went to quit. All I mean, right. I'd gone into quit. I was, I didn't know. And, and this is all back to what was the starting of Keller Williams. Right. I had no plans, Tim. I just, you know, i I'm not going to be talked to that way. I'm not going to be treated this way. Uh, I'm not going to build something. And then you, because you're the, you're the boss, uh, that you can just tear it down and do that. 
And so I was, I was leaving. Um, no, I just wrote a, a big, I just wrote a big six figure number that I knew he wouldn't pay or I thought he wouldn't pay. <laughs> and, and then of course he paid. Right. So I, I went out and, um, uh, and launched that business for him. Can you say, and, then, and if you can't, I understand, but can you say what he did that was so disruptive or damaging to your office? Yeah, it's real simple. And this is all leading up to your question of, so how do we start Keller Williams? Yeah, so, I'm in no rush. Um, yeah. So what happened was he had a policy and guideline manual and the policy and guideline manual for all of his offices in three cities uh, had a clause in it that said that if the company changes the pol- a policy, you have 48 hours to give notice that you don't agree with the policy. Otherwise, you're now under the policy. And so on Christmas Eve, he went to all his offices and, and changed a policy about how people got paid. <laughs> and, and, oh, exactly. that is a terrible, terrible move. Wow. It was. It was. And in fact, the policy had to do with what happens when people leave, which I thought was really interesting. Anyway, so I had built this highly uh, successful business with literally no, no new people. These were all really, um, seasoned vets, uh, great people, and they weren't going to take this. So they left and literally it, it, it destroyed it. What he did destroyed the office. And so I went to him and said, okay, I quit. Um, I'll go back in and put it back the way it was. But when I get it there, I'm out of here. And that's when he said, well, what will it take to keep you? Um, and I, I wrote a number down and he said, OK, I'm going to put you in charge of, of VP in charge of expanding the company. And your first job is to go back and rebuild that business. So I went back and rebuilt it. And then I got sent to another location in Austin down south. And about, I would say, maybe a month and a half into that at most, um, he called me up out of the blue and wanted to know what I'd done for him. Now, I understand that my office was in an office building in South Austin, and I was in the broom closet. And I know it was the broom closet because there were brooms in it. Uh, and it did have a window, however, and they gave me a folding table for my desk, a folding table for as a credenza, if you will. Uh, and then they gave me um, uh, two, two folding chairs and a flip chart and a phone and said, go, go, go build another company. Well, I did. And uh, had I stayed, this was, was in 1983, had I stayed, he owed, he owed me a huge bonus, but it was never about the money. So I, you know, in the end, and so I just quit, you know, and I didn't know what I was going to do. That's the thing. I really didn't know. I just, I just knew that I wasn't going to work for someone who talked to people that way. And the other thing that was going on in his firm, where there were, there were men and women who had been with him a long, long time, and he had promised them um, you know, compensation in the form of stock or profits interest. And what was happening was now he was taking all that back. He was undoing all of that and trying to pull everything back into himself. And I saw the writing on the wall because I'm looking up going, well, what's my future with a guy like that? And I, you know, in other words, I too could work for 20 years for a guy like that and then have him pull the rug out and not have anything. That's the way I, I internalized that. So I quit. And um, my wife at the time, I had been, I'd been married now for approximately a year and a half. And my wife uh, became his assistant. And she was already in the firm. And uh, she'd actually um, – uh, had been an administrative assistant in the firm. And so she, he recruited her to come work directly for him. So I, the comp, we, uh, so I, so I ended up, he called me and treated me that way. I went in, I went in the next day and quit. And this time I didn't name a price. I just said, I'm done. And, uh, I gave him all the names of all the people I had recruited and all the info I had on them. And it was a, it was a, I think approximately it was 14 people. And they were all terrific, terrific real estate um, agent prospects. And um, I just gave him the list. If I if I had just uh, stayed a little longer, he'd owed me a huge bonus check. But I but I, I didn't care about it. And I, I walked out. And there was a gentleman that was in the commercial area of that company called Joe Williams. And I approached Joe and I said, why don't we form t- t- two companies? I'll form a residential, you form commercial. We'll each own, you know, 50 percent of each. And we'll go build this. And the commercial company never took off, but but the residential side uh, took off immediately and um, never lost money. We had borrowed $44,000 to launch the business. 
And we paid that back in a little over a year. And to this day, uh, we have no operational debt on the company. I've never borrowed or money, and I've never taken any outside money uh, to build Keller Williams. We all did it by internal cash flow. And now, is there aside from having the cash flow to do that? Uh, since a, a lot of people in many industries will leverage and borrow, uh, mm-hmm. what were the main reasons, if there were others, uh, aside from just having plentiful cash flow? Uh, for not taking on debt to try to grow faster? Man, that's a, that's a wonderful question. You know, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll cheat and I'll give you a quote from Robert Kiyosaki, which is, assets feed me, liabilities eat me. And I, that mantra kind of plays in my head a little bit, that if you have to borrow money, it means you can't afford what you're fixing to buy. Even though that's, by the way, that's not true, right? It's it's not true. I, I definitely have u- I use debt to buy real estate when it makes sense. Uh, I I use debt when it it makes sense to buy a business. So I'm I'm not the no debt guy, but I I do come from a of a position of um, I want to be I want to be smart with money such that money doesn't leave me, and and debt's a way to do that. So I, other than that, it, it the the reality is is that. It, it didn't take a lot of money to build a real estate business because real estate is one of the few careers where you can come in as a job. And then as you generate more income, you just get rid of You start shedding the jobs and it naturally leads to a business with employed people. I don't know if that makes sense, but but you can literally leverage your way all the way from being a salesperson to owning a business. Um, I contrast that to like the. Uh, the people that do the maintenance in this building. There's no natural path from being a, you know, being the maintenance crew on a building to owning the building. It's not, na- it's not a natural path. It doesn't lead to that. But in real estate, it, it actually does. You, you can literally, you do all the jobs from day one, and as you lever up and bring in other people, so you, you ultimately get rid of all the jobs. So maybe that helps explain why I actually didn't need the capital. I didn't need it because. Um, I was I was organically growing and generating more cash flow. And, and my understanding is that, and you can correct me if I'm if I'm off the, on the uh, timeline for this, but two or so years later, KW, right, yep. Keller Williams is mm-hmm. the largest office in Austin, and yep. that's right. Uh, as as you mentioned, you don't necessarily need a lot of cash to get started or to enter the game of real estate. So it's a very competitive, it's a very competitive industry. Uh, yes, it to, is. to what do you attribute your ability to not, not only become the largest office and obviously that's expanded to nationwide and, and, and so worldwide. on and worldwide. Uh, th- what it, but in that first two years, let's just say to, mm-hmm. to what do you attribute your ability to stand out and, grow so effectively? Well, I understood value. So what I understood was, is that the real estate agent has the, has the relationship with the client and the real estate brokerage company has a relationship with the agent. And I, I understood exactly what the value proposition needed to be to attract and retain really terrific people. So I understood that. And the the way I like to say it is, Um, Keller Williams was my third business, if you think about it, because I'd already launched two businesses for my former uh, boss. So you'd been learning on someone else's dime, so to speak. Yes, absolutely. And the best way to learn, right? Uh, So I I was intimate. I had intimate knowledge with the financials and what it cost. And I understood how much uh, revenue I had to generate in order to to you know, cross the hurdle uh, into pro- positive cash flow. And so I just knew it. So I, I set the business up that way. I kind of play a game that, that I call red light, green light. And um, meaning that if I'm doing well, uh, then green light, keep, keep, keep going that direction. If something happens, the, I, I don't keep hitting the green light, right? If something happens that should cause me to pause in any way, uh, particularly from a financial standpoint, then I'm going to hit red light fast and I'm going to back up and ask the question, um, what do I need to do? What did I do wrong? Whatever, what happened? So the, 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 the building of a real estate company, you can generate all the cash flow you need to do that. Even in these times right now of, you know, I, I have competitors who have raised over a billion dollars 
and are just spending the money like crazy in the real estate space. But what I understand is it doesn't take all that money to do that. It takes smart money more than it takes a lot of money. Oh, for sure. I mean, there's no, uh, certainly no lack of uh, examples of companies that have pissed away <laughs> yeah. hundreds of millions of dollars or more. I, I, I'd That's love right. to hear an example, if you could give one, of uh, a time when you saw the red light or hit the red light, and then how you did a post-game analysis. Well, um, probably the, the biggest red light that I had to hit early on was the commercial side red light. And it, cause it never made a profit and we would literally just take the money that I was earning from the company I started and hand it to the other company that was being run by my partner. And he's a good guy. He's a great guy. Uh, Joe Williams, just a salt of the earth. Uh, um, just a, just a wonderful human being, but uh, it was losing money. And I hit the red light immediately and said, I'm not going to give you any more money. And, uh, his response was, well, how am I going to pay the bills? And my response was exactly, exactly. How are you? How are you going to pay your bills? Yeah, and and then he voluntarily shut the company down uh, within a few months. How so did that, that was. How did that conversation? If you don't mind me, I apologize for the interruptions, mm, but I'm very interested. No. How how did that? Uh, how was that sort of dissolution or separation handled? This is a very common situation among co-founders. It happens yeah. all the time. Uh, were Were there any particular things that you feel that you guys did right or that you did right? Uh, in handling that? Were there things that you would have done differently in retrospect? Um, actually, with between he and I, no. It was a, it was a, um, it was a natural thing. I had, I, we didn't have an agreement that said that we had to take one, you know, one pot of money and give it to the other pot. So, and it, and it was amicable. I mean, there was no, I would say that I don't think that, that Joe and I ever had a cross word. I think that uh, he's a, he, he, it's a testimony to him. He's just a stand up guy. And, but on the other hand, I'm not going to keep putting good money into a bad situation, right. Uh, that, that you can see doesn't have a plan, uh, that it can execute successfully on. So it, it was really that simple. They were separate businesses and I wasn't obligated to give the money. So I just stopped. I hit the red light and I just stopped. Um, uh, and so that's kind of, you know, the, uh, I, I would say if you're, if you want to ask the question of what have you learned over time, not what did you learn from that mm -hmm. was that, um, your, your agreements between you and your partners, uh, I call them disagreements because the only time you're going to read it is when you disagree. Right. And, <laughs> That's so true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a, it, and that, that really informs the way you look at a document when you call it a disagreement. Uh, because it's there to it's it should be there to to deal with it when you dis deal with things when you disagree. Otherwise, if you agree, you never read the document. You never yeah, go back to it. Yeah, that's genius. Yeah, that's a yeah, great way the, to reframe it. Well, and the biggest issue, the, I I find the biggest issues are who has control, who's who's the decision maker. Can that decision maker be relieved from that if you have to? Uh, how are you going to handle um, cash flow if there's profit? Are you going to distribute it? Monthly, quarterly, annually, never. What, what are you, you going to do? And then the other one is the dissolution. And that is what happens if this isn't working out and one of you needs to buy the other one out. One of the things that happened to me was, so we, we ended up forming this firm. And in, 80, in February of 84, and I'd now been married uh, less than three years, uh, the company was just a little over one year old. And uh, my my wife of, of that at that time said she didn't love me and she'd never loved me. And uh, we we headed to divorce and they they started out at a million dollar valuation on a one year old company <laughs> that if you took me out of it would be worthless. Uh, and I, I didn't I ended up negotiating my divorce with my former boss. So if, if you want to read between the lines and think about that, you're welcome to do so. Uh, right. I turned to yeah. my attorney and said, why am I taking the deposition of that guy? And my attorney just looked at me and says, well, time will reveal all. And, and it did by the way, but the, the agreement to break up, right. If someone passes away or if someone wants to sell, um, to me, that becomes one of the biggest clauses in those agreements. And, and candidly, you'd be really, really, you know, smart at the, at this, because this is where, 
people go, oh, we're good, we get along, we're good friends or whatever. We're going to found a company together. And they look up later and they realize that they don't have a disagreement. Yeah. They basically have an agreement. This and is that, so important. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they don't have it. They have no means of reconciliation. They have no means of parting without bankrupting the other business. So what happened to me was uh, when I got to the divorce, uh, I had a buy-sell agreement, by the way. And it would have meant that I would have, I, I could have gone into my uh, bank account and written the check for what I owed under the, under the buy-sell agreement. Can you define for people who don't know what that means, a buy-sell agreement? Mm-hmm. Sure. This simply means that uh, if I'm one of the partners and I want out, uh, what what happens, right? Does the, the, does the document address that at all? Can I sell the stock to anybody? Uh, does, does the company have to buy it? Uh, if the company has to buy it or wants to buy it, what are the terms of that? Or are there no terms and it's just strictly a cash deal? What happened? Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's, a, that's basically a buy-sell. Uh, it's a, it's a prearranged way that, that things are going to go if you decide to part company for any reason, or you need to part company for any reason. Well, I had one, Tim, but the, the judge in the case says, well, okay, I see you have a buy sell agreement. Um, who represented you, Mr. Keller? And I said, my attorney standing here. He said, who represented her? And I said, my attorney standing here and they threw it out. Uh, yeah, because we had used the same attorney, good attorney, and he hadn't cheated anybody. It was a it was a fair buy sell agreement, but um, they they threw it out. Yeah, this is I want to underscore a couple of really, really important things that you're saying. So number one is whether it's uh, I mean, particularly, I would say in, in personal relationships like a marriage how critical it is to have separate counsel, right? For the for That's right. for a million and one reasons, and then also uh, the a pattern that's come up in a lot of these interviews, which is from the outside looking in, many uh, many interviewees who are viewed as risk takers are actually experts mm-hmm. in capping the downside. Uh, That's right. That's and right. are very good at thinking through the worst case scenarios and uh, pl- setting plans, if then plans, for for the divorce proceedings or mm-hmm. the escape plan, so to speak. That's right. If those worst come, those worst case scenarios come to pass. Uh, That's the, exactly right. The, the very first thing I look at in every contract that gets sent to me, uh, especially if um, I, there's some type of personal guarantee or I'm involved, I'm, I'm involved personally, is the termination clause. Not because I mm-hmm. want to weasel out of something, not because I want to plan for failure. It's for all the reasons that you just mentioned. If, if you don't have a plan for the disagreement, which it's, it's such a smart reframe, uh, you're dead in the water because the, the, That's right. the when you're going to need that document is when you do not see eye to eye or have a problem. So let me tell you a funny story, or I don't know how funny it is, but um, so I after that divorce, um, you know, I met the love of my life, Mary, and we've been married for 32 years. And um, her father, when he was alive, um, her mother had passed away from cancer uh, many, many years ago, and and her father was was now getting remarried. And I now, having lived this, Tim, I turned to my father-in-law and said, I'm getting you a lawyer and your fiance needs to get a lawyer and they need to be separate. And there needs to be uh, essentially a um, a prenuptial contract, which is (laughs) very closely related to the buy sell, (laughs) you know, Um, you know, basically it's a disillusion, disillusionment uh, agreement, right? So they did. They each got separate attorneys and they did this prenuptial. Well, fast forward to um, the last year of my father-in-law's life where he was beginning to get dementia. And uh, he then passes away. And within a few days after him passing away, um, uh, we get, a, we get a, a, an envelope that in it is a handwritten, I give all my money to my wife. Right. I give all of my my liquid assets to my wife and it has his signature. Now, at the time, we didn't know that he actually had been diagnosed with dementia. We, we, we were unaware of that. Um, and he had actually said just a month or so before he died, he said, watch her. She's going to try to take everything. 
and and it happened. And um, she and the weird thing is, is that she um, for that little sheet of paper, she took a, a gentleman who was suffering from dementia and she took it to her lawyer, the same one that had drawn up her side of the prenuptial. And um, of course, we hired a, a good law firm and that took about five minutes to the, the law firm had to recuse themselves and then to to basically explain that that we would drag this out forever uh, because the man had dementia and it was documented. Uh, we went back and checked and it was documented, uh, but the spouse had never told the kids any of that. So my, my little lesson turned around and paid huge dividends for my, my father-in-law and his estate because they could not pierce it. Yep. That's, that's a great example. Uh, and, uh, uh, it's very, really important. Very close friend of mine. One of his uh, uncles has dementia, very well documented, and he's uh, suing other members of the family. And there are all sorts of, of headache and heartache, as you as you might imagine. Uh, and it's yes. it's very it's, horrible. it's really important for yourself. Um, and, and, uh, and we're going to come back to to your story in a second. But broadly speaking to determine who will make decisions, who can make decisions for someone else if they are incapacitated or dead yep. or yes. diagnosed with something like dementia. Yes. And uh, I, I recently helped a friend who did not have any of this in place to figure out a way. Thankfully, her uh, her parent is uh, lucid, not does not have dementia. They just don't didn't have the cash to set this up beforehand. But to talk to talk about things like power of attorney documents, uh, when things are reasonably stable, so that people can make decisions for someone else when the time comes, and lawyers say or That's hospitals right. say, show us the documents. You want to have those beforehand. Uh, so, so I'd like to come back to. So one one statement about that. And oh, that sure. Is one, no, just one one of the lessons that I've learned, Tim, is that money won't change you, but it will reveal you. And when when people have an opportunity to have a a financial windfall, their character is getting ready to be uh, revealed. Yes, completely consistent with my <laughs> observations as well. And yeah. having a and having a document, whether it be uh, you know with loved you know helping loved ones protect themselves or in business, it actually is it's it's really important. People have asked me over the years about Keller Williams and and uh, what's important about it, and I I always give the same answer, and that is uh, our most important asset is our franchise document, which is a massive disagreement. Mm -hmm. so, so let's actually uh, i'm going to i'm going to veto my my earlier pivot and and talk about that for a second because i i want to spend a good amount of time talking about focus because you are famous for your ability to focus uh but before we get to that you're talking about this franchise document and uh, i know very little about real estate but uh a a friend of mine when i was doing prep for this said that you redefined franchising through regional ownerships. And then he went on to say mm -hmm. how the company's made more money year on year since they started in 85. I think at one point it was like 40% yep. per year for a decade or something. I mean, really incredible growth. But yep. could, could you talk about, so you have the franchise document. You, you also innovated in terms of uh, model, as, as I understand it. What does redefined franchising through regional ownerships mean? If well, that's, that's accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, you actually asked a couple of questions. And I know that. It's my, but my let, tendency. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I just want to. Uh, so let's talk about that regional. So when we when we as a company were ready to go out of out of state, if you will, um, we we began to study how others had done it. And we discovered that in the real estate industry and in other industries as well, that the at the time they they did what's called master franchises. So uh, franchising, remember, is, is just another vehicle, uh, financial vehicle, right? If you don't have the money, franchise and ask other people to come in and front the cost that it would have been had you employed them. So that's that's one of the ways you keep from having to borrow money 
understand is is you could use franchising and essentially use other people's money. I had actually expanded into four cities, and all of them did great as long as I showed up. And then and then when I didn't show up, they all started failing. So I took a year off in '89, and one of the things and 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 began to document the business, and because the there's an incredible story about uh, the McDonald's brothers and and behind the Golden Arches that really just changed my my world, and one of them was around franchising, and the other one was about uh, building a successful model, and the franchising part was that we looked into it and we discovered that the way that franchising had been done was flawed. And that was called the master franchise approach. So Dairy Queen was a perfect example. So Dairy Queen at one time was like, you know, the kick butt take name um, fast food place in America. And what they had done is they had sold the, um, the, the, the rights for the franchises, the, what you would call the the regional franchises to then be the franchisor of the franchisees. So the print company wasn't all it was franchising was, you know, these regional um, uh, businesses to then go and they would sell franchises and they would support the franchises. Okay, so just, if you were just in, to restate so I understand. So you might have like arbitrarily, let's just say you cut the country into four quadrants. You have four yep. regional people. Those are your yep. only kind of direct reports who pay you. And then they have a downline of sorts where they then go That's out. Right. But you're only interacting with those. You only have agreements with those four regional uh, franchisees who then become franchisors, right. meaning they're granting these licenses to other people. That's right. And it's called sub-franchising. And, and I, I, so I, I read the Dairy Queen story because when McDonald's came out with their playground, that was actually an amazing value hack, right? I mean, they, 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 they realized that if they could get the kids uh, wanting to, to come to McDonald's, the parents, you know, would take them, right? And there's a playground. So there was a famous meeting where the these uh, master franchisors, if you will, the sub franchisor, uh, met, and I don't know how many there were uh, in it, but they met and they decided that they didn't want to do the playgrounds. This is for that, Dairy, for Dairy Queen or for McDonald's? Uh-huh, for, for, for Dairy, Dairy Queen. Queen. Mm-hmm. So McDonald's was doing it, and uh, and and really, you know, making inroads fast. Uh, and so Dairy Queen calls a meeting and says, "Hey, we need to our franchisees need to be putting in playgrounds." And the sub franchisors, the regional people said, no, not going to do it. And um, by the way, that was the beginning of, of Dairy Queen sliding into uh, a, a, a much smaller company than they could have been. And they never, they never really recovered from that. Um, so I read that, and I, my, my, um, uh, my plan then was I'm not going to repeat that. So we did, a, we did what's called a regional representative agreement. So the financial opportunity is the same. So we have 31 regions in the U.S. and Canada, and those are owned by individuals, and, but they're not sub-franchisors. They are simply representatives. So they have the, the same job description of a sub-franchise. They have the same financial opportunity of a sub-franchise. They don't have the authority. Mm-hmm. And I would imagine the franchise document that you have prevents the type of log jam if you were to mm-hmm. say we want to install playgrounds at the uh, yep. in your offices so, uh, you know, metaphorically speaking in those thirty one the home office has the ability to uh, insist let's let's say on certain types of things so that they wouldn't run into the same type of Dairy Queen problem. We, we, we have, that's, that's, that's right. Without having to go into the weeds on documents, you, you said that very well. The, the document uh, lays out the rights of the franchisor. And the reason is because uh, if, there is, if a right isn't acknowledged in that document, the judge will automatically give it to the franchisee. Yep. If, it's an, if it's an unstated uh, right, uh, then the the courts will will take it away. So you, if it's it, not again, a, if it, it's it, not explicitly assigned to you, KW the franchisor, it will be uh, in a, in a vacuum of mention in the document, automatically assigned to the franchisee every time. 
yeah. every time. So when people read a franchise document, if they don't say, heck no, I'm not signing this, it's an intelligence test. <laughs> they, that should be your first reaction. What I explained to them is that this is a disagreement and that the, the odds are pretty strong that anything we don't address here as my rights become your rights by default. So this is gonna this is gonna read like the most one-sided agreement you you've ever seen. But I just want you to realize that anything that isn't covered in this document automatically goes to you, and you are the decider. So, so that was that's that that was the 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 regional side of that story. The the other side of the McDonald's behind the golden arches that just really profoundly impacted me was the story of the French fries. Do, do you know that story? I don't know if I know the story. I watched okay, well, I watched the movie with mm-hmm. uh, Birdman. I'm blanking on the, uh, on the on the actor's name. Beetlejuice. Somebody will uh, Michael Keaton. But uh, I I haven't. I don't have any background beyond that. So this is a great story, and it it hit me like a ton of bricks when I read it. And I'm just going to paraphrase and tell it to you as if it's a bedtime story. But please so, do. Yeah, so this guy, Ray Kroc, this is, Ke- this is Keller all the way, right? So Ray Kroc, um, he hears about these McDonald's brothers, and uh, they people line up uh, you know, around the block uh, to, to get their food, uh, and he's a salesman, and so he wants to go down and meet with them and understand their secrets so he can go back and take it to his, to his customers so then they could order more Dixie Cups and whatever he was selling them. He got down there. And was enamored with them and, and asked, could he franchise? And it was a tough, it was a tough negotiation. They ultimately allowed him. He goes back to Illinois. He builds out the stuff that he needs to build out in order to be able to, you know, deliver stores that sell food exactly like the McDonald's brothers. And the challenge was the French fries didn't taste right. So he calls the McDonald's brothers and, uh, uh, and and says, you know, tell me what we did wrong or whatever. And nobody could figure it out. So um, what McDonald's did, and I love this phrase, they suspended their need to understand. <laughs> and they and they went and they went all the way back to where they bought the potato, and they documented, they tracked and documented all the steps from the from the field to the table, uh. and, and they discovered, yeah, and they discovered. One, they discovered something, and that is the McDonald brothers had not invented a way to cook a French fry. They had stumbled on a way to cure a potato. What was happening, the step that the McDonald's brothers never told Ray Kroc was that when they got the potatoes, uh, they put them in uh, open air burlap sacks, and in the climate where the McDonald's uh, operated, when you put potatoes in an open air burlap sack in that temperature, the potato cures. <laughs> Amazing. And then, oh, by the way, you can cook it any way you want, and it tastes great. So, and so, so that, so okay. by the way, so just end of the story. So Ray Kroc went back to to Illinois. He duplicated the curing process, and the rest is history. That's incredible. So the, this then brings us back to the year off in 89. I have a, a bunch of questions about that. So 89... Uh, Paint a picture for how the business is doing, because I'm sure a lot of people are thinking to themselves, man, I'd love to take a year off. My business is hectic. How in the hell did <laughs> Gary yeah. take a year off in 89? How, how did you decide to do that? Was there a straw that broke the camel's back? And then practically let's speaking, a, yeah, how did you do it? Okay, so let's, let's, te- let's um, keep me on track here, but, but I, I want to go, I want to go back and I want to I want to build to that to the moment of eighty nine, so you'll understand mm-hmm. what happened. So in um, so we launch in in eighty in the last quarter of eighty three. <clears throat> um, I end up in February of eighty four, uh, becoming you know going through a divorce, and and now I am in debt because I um, I I had to sign, I didn't have the cash, so I had to sign a note. Uh, and then I had to take an insurance policy in case I died. Uh, my my former spouse got paid, and then within a year, Joe Williams came in and said he has to sell his shares um, in the residential company. Uh, we'd already shut the other one down, commercial down, but he needed to sell his shares 
because he'd bought a lot of real estate. <clears throat> the markets, this is now 87, right? This is 88. The markets are, are crashing and um, he doesn't want to go bankrupt. And he didn't to his credit. He did not. He's just a stand up guy. But he came to me and said, hey, I need to sell the shares. So all of a sudden I didn't have the cash. So I have to sign a note to the banks, take out another insurance policy. <laughs> so essentially, whether I live or die, everyone's going to get their money. Does that make sense? It makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And the way I kind of describe it, particularly when I'm talking to kids, is that um, it was like I'd been going through life hopping, you know, seven feet and fell in a 10-foot hole. And the, it, this is, this, that, that right there has become the central theme of my life since that happened. Because I'd been going through life and competing as a business person in a sort of organic, progressive way. In other words, it's the next thing I should do, so I do there, I go there. But I wasn't on an exponential path. In other words, I wasn't running my business uh, out of a business plan that would deliver exponential growth. I was living off of an organic plan. Now I looked down and I realized, oh my gosh, it's going to take me 10 years under this current, you know, uh, earnings path I'm on, maybe sooner, but not much before I'm debt free. And that depressed the heck out of me. And so I got really creative. Then, then one last thing happened. Then one of my competitors uh, with uh, a Remax office set up shop down the street and they were a lot less expensive than what we did. And I had five of my top 10 producers leave the firm. And, and I, had, I had grown to over 70 associates. The, the economy um, uh, going down uh, took me to 38 associates. We were still profitable, nicely profitable. And then I lost five of the top, of the top 10. And so now I'm at 33 associates. And then they came back and they got my bookkeeper, my receptionist, and my relocation coordinator. Man, that sounds like a really hard twelve to eighteen so month period. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. So what? So now I just want to set the stage for eighty nine. So now what's happened is I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. The market is crashing, right? And my competitors are taking my people. So I'm literally sitting at the desk <clears throat> with no one, no one to run the business other than me, and I'm in desperate need of a plan that would actually help me hop higher. And so I, I created that plan. And one year later, um, we were the largest real estate company in Austin. And one, the next year, we sold more real estate than anyone. And the next year after that, I paid everybody off in cash. And I was, I was, I was, I was 31 years old. I was um, uh, at to towards the end of it, 31, by the way. Uh, I, I paid everyone off in cash. I was debt free, and I was the number one real estate company in my city. So that plan was the plan that you drafted during your year off. Is that right? No, or, no, 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 that's no, it's a separate issue. So oh, it's a separate issue. Okay. It's a separate issue. So the, so the, the plan is what it ultimately created a model that I could go teach other people and I could franchise that model. So let's, so then let's go to, um, uh, 80, 88, 87, 88. So I go around the, the state of Texas and I'm, I'm showing how I'm doing business and people are buying, at that time, license agreements, because I wasn't franchising at the time. So they bought license agreements, and the agreement said, if I ever franchise, um, you have to become, become a franchisee or have the right to buy your business. What is that? Could you clarify what the difference is? So licensing, they're paying a percentage just to use your name? Yep. And that's yep. it? And you're licensing to use your name and systems, but you don't really have any control or influence. I see. With the, li with the license versus franchising. So the... Um, so I was using a simple license agreement. Well, I was I was literally traveling four days a week, right? If it was Monday, I'm in San Antonio. If I'm in Houston, it's Tuesday. I mean, it, that I was living my life that way, and and all the businesses that we launched were were successful and profitable. And me, I'm thinking I'm a genius, so I I come home, and then they all fail. And so what I did was I did two things. Number one is <clears throat> I hired an individual. And uh, that individual, this is now, now we're getting to 89, okay? So I then, I then take that year off, if you will. I'm not franchising. I'm not licensing. I'm not doing anything. I've hired a manager to run my Austin operation. So I have the freedom. And I hired a gentleman. 
and gave him a video recorder, a, an audio recorder, a uh, notebook and pen and a camera. And I said, I want you to follow me around and I'm going to go launch another office. And I want you to document every little thing that I do. That is brilliant. What, no, that's the, that's the French fry story. Yeah, that, that exactly. was that. Yeah. So I read the French fry story about that time. And then I said, okay, so my first, the, the number one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go do that. The second thing I'm going to do is, uh, so I'm going to create an operating man, set of manuals that, that absolutely uh, show how to launch it, how to run it, right? And, um, and the second thing I did was I uh, discovered a list of the top 10 franchise attorneys in the country, and I started interviewing. And I ended up hiring this amazing individual out of Dallas, and she was the one she, it was her who said, you do not want to master franchise. You want to, re, you want to use a regional representative uh, approach. Now, and just to I, clarify, at the time, were you interviewing them to potentially be your attorney, or are you interviewing yes. them and paying them for their time as part of your research? I, I, I actually hired them to help me build a franchise document, the lawyer. And, and she, and then she came back and said, you don't, you don't want to do what the others do. So the way we built our document was we, we, we went and got our hands on our competitors documents and we got our hands on McDonald's document. And then we, we took them by sections. So we, we created, I don't think, I think it was like 19 manuals and each manual had how each of these franchisors dealt with issue number one. The next manual was how they dealt with issue number two. The third manual was how they all dealt. So I now can pick up manual one and I can see how all these franchisors have dealt with that issue in their document. And with Joyce's guidance, we went through and made decisions chapter by chapter, if you will, <clears throat> on how we wanted to build our franchise, if that makes sense. Yeah, this makes sense. Yeah. So we came at, so by the way, so at the end of 89, uh, by the way, I, I, I did spend all my money. I just want to be clear that uh, hiring that, that that attorney said that they, she gave me a bid to build that document at a hundred thousand dollars. She quit bill, billing me. <laughs> That's how expensive the document was. It was it is a serious document. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. So then I take this document and I take yeah, now. Pause for one second. So you're saying hundred thousand dollars. How much money do you think that document has saved you? Excluding the headache and heartache, and oh. <laughs> it's the—I will assure you—it is the most valuable asset of the company. <laughs> it, hands down, it's the most valuable asset. There's, there's no, there's not even a, a, a close second. <clears throat> it is, it is the, it, it is the key asset. So I went back. So now I take all, of, I take these manuals, and I take the um, uh, franchise document. I go back to Houston. I meet this lovely individual. Um, who sadly just passed away last year, but um, this is 1989. And so I go back, uh, sign her up. I give her a two-week training program, and then I leave. <laughs> and I hold my breath and go, come on, sevens, right? I mean, it's it's um, I'm holding my breath because I'm not coming back, right? I can't scale this thing if I have to go do it. Uh, I can only scale it if others can follow the, the, the model. And um, – she did real well, and that is a hugely successful business today. Uh, in fact, it's funny that um, uh, her uh, she had told her son that um, that that I had basically saved her life. And when my when my son was real little, um, uh, Mary, my wife, and 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 our our son were in a grocery store here in Austin, and this franchisee happened to be here visiting her sister, and they ran into her at a grocery store. And my wife tells me that she got down on her knees to stare at my little boy and proceed to tell him, though he couldn't comprehend a word she was saying, uh, how what I did had had changed her life. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, so that's the story of 89. The story of 89 was I took a year off and I reinvented how I did business. And I basically created the platform, if you want to call it that, for building a nationwide a real estate franchise. What a story. Yeah. Thank you for telling that. I, oh, I want to talk about the flip chart that you mentioned 
uh, at the beginning of the conversation when you were uh-huh. in the in the broom closet. Yep. So, so you K- KW is very heavily investing in technology. It's it's uh, in many respects yes. becoming a technology company. Yep. Yet, my understanding is you still use a paper month at a glance calendar and yep. a pencil. What what is the story behind that? You know the. Um I believe that, and I, I didn't always believe this, right? It, it's, it's, you learn as, as you, you go, and if you learn, you grow, right? Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble visualizing my life. And I get this month at a glance, <clears throat> and instantaneously I can see where all my energy this month is going. I can see how I'm investing my life. And so I, I, I begin this practice back in my 20s of using this month at a glance and I could see everything at one time right and I use an eraser because if you erase you must replace so I I go through the month and I kind of mark you know what I what I think I should be doing on these days in order to hit my personal and professional and financial goals and I'm I'm happy to erase if I need to but by doing it this way if it was important to do it, I can't, it can't disappear. I have to move it someplace else in my calendar. So it's really a simple, this, the simple idea that I don't, I don't, I really struggle with the idea of doing planning off of a, um, uh, a technology based, uh, day timer so for that reason only. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, um, uh, there's a, there's a, a, a guy by the name of Larry Bragg and he was, uh, the, um, uh, a lead singer for uh, Tower Power, and uh, I didn't know him personally, but uh, I was coming back from Vegas uh, on a trip, and I'd gotten to the Southwest Airlines, uh, you know, gate early, and there was only one guy in front of me, <clears throat> and I recognized him as the lead singer of Tower Power. And then I looked down, and he had a briefcase, and it had a tag that said Tower Power on it, right? <laughs> and I went, "Okay, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure this is Larry, right?" So I say, excuse me, you know, I just introduced myself and we had a great talk because I'd just seen them perform uh, a year earlier in Austin. And um, so we had a great conversation. Somehow we turned to uh, Kenny Loggins was coming to Austin to a concert and um, in a venue that 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 we love and 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 support and. And Larry and how, somehow I came out and, and, and Larry used to had sung with Kenny Loggins and loved him. And he said, man, I'd love to catch that show. My family's still there. And I said, well, yeah, I can I can I can get you in. He said, well, what date is that? And uh, I knew the date off the top of my head and I said it. And then he pulls out his electronic calendar and starts going through it. And I went, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold it. You, you've gone to the dark side. And he's laughing. He's going, what do you mean? I said, OK, let's have let's have a, a gunfight at the OK Corral. You put your phone back down and I'll lay my calendar out here. And when when I say go and I'll go one, two, three, go. When I say go, we both reach for our guns and see who's the first one who can shoot. He just looked at me and I said, let's do it. Let's see what happens. So. He says, OK. So I go, one, two, three, go. I just pick up my calendar, pull it open, and go, there it is. And he's still trying to get into his phone, right? And then I said, and oh, by the way, I can tell you what I'm doing tomorrow at 3 o'clock. I can tell you what I'm doing um, two weeks from now. I can tell you what I did, everything I did last week. And I'm just, I'm just peppering him with my vision for my life. And he's still fumbling trying to get to the – to, to see if he could even go to the concert, which he did, by the way, and it was awesome. And he and Kenny hung out afterwards. Where does your uh, month at a glance calendar live? Is it something that's in your, right in front of me? Is it in your on your wall in your office? Is it? No, no, it, I carry no, I carry it with me. You carry it. I with carry you. it with me at all times, everywhere. It never leaves my side. Actually, it's in my backpack. <laughs> <laughs> but I created day. I created kind of a daily worksheet. So as the day is going on, I don't actually need my calendar per se, right? Because I'm working off of that. But the second that I need to do planning, I got to get back to a month. I have to see the month. And it, I can flip easily and look at the other months, right? And for me, when I'm planning out 
time off and vacations and other things, it really helps for me to see the spacing of my life, to see the things that I'm doing that give me energy, to see the things that take energy away from me so that I can always, I can always be fine tuning uh, my life uh, quick, quickly at a glance. So anyway, it's just a, it's a really good, it's a good way to do it. It does fly in the face of, um, you know, the way that other people look at time and, and using electronics or digital time management systems. But I, I just can't get rid of it because it makes me, it makes me so aware of my life. Yeah. I, th- I, I think that's, can, I, can, I think that's really important to underscore, right? It's not just about the, if, the efficiency and speed. It's about the no, awareness right. that it cultivates. Well, it's actually all that's the speed was just a funny joke that happened, but the, <clears throat> it really is more about my ability to see everything at a glance. And it's easy for me then to see <clears throat> how many times uh, in, you know, in the last 30 days or looking forward to the next 30 days, I have planned uh, right to, to back in the day to go to lunch with my son. Right. Mm-hmm. I can I can actually see it. I can add it up and show you quickly at a glance. I can say, well, we did that three times last month. Uh, this month looks like we have it planned for five, blah, 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 blah. So give for me personally, it gives me great vision, if you will. Uh, and so I can I can manage my energy and I can always make sure that I have enough time set aside for the things that really matter. And I can see that better at a glance when I'm looking at a bigger picture. And that's the only that's the value. That's the only value. Let's let's talk a little bit about spacing. Two things you mentioned: spacing and energy. Uh, I I don't know if you still think about uh, treating your time like going to the movies. Uh, this mm-hmm. is something I came across, which I thought was mm-hmm. uh, very helpful as a as a comparison. Could you could you speak to what you mean by that? Oh, well, that one is about time blocking. So yeah. the, the, yeah, so the, it, in the, I'll just speak for myself. The, um, the, it is very hard to have a perfect day every day. And as, as the research will, will tell you that, um, uh, willpower is on will call, right? It's not, you, you don't have a steady stream of willpower, um, when you wake up in the morning and it doesn't matter what time, and if you got up at six, if you got up at noon, when you wake up, this, these are your power hours. Um, and I used to tell people, look, the goal is to have a great day by noon. In other words, get everything, get everything that matters, that is important to you, get it done. Don't put it off, get it done. And then let the events of the morning drive your afternoon. Uh, and so time blocking is just this idea of you pre-planning uh, your time, because if, if you needed to exercise, then and that's what you want to do. You're going to have to find the time to do it, and then you're going to have to block that out. The, the movie analogy was um, <clears throat> was this idea that you don't really need to time block more than two or three hours a day around your, your core activity for your business, whatever that is. You don't, you're, you're not equally effective all day long. So what you want to do is you want to find that you want to make sure that that the world doesn't infringe on the time, uh, that you've, that, that, you know, you need to give, uh, for whatever it is, is the key that makes your professional life run. And so I, I just time block and 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 I encourage it. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and those two to three hours, uh, are, like a film, right? I mean, if, if that is, yes. you're, if you yes. go to see a movie, you're there exclusively to see a movie. So you turn off your cell phone, you get snacks yep. in case you're hungry. Yes. You might make yes. a pit stop in the bathroom beforehand. You do all of that. So it can be, you can have an uninterrupted two to three hours. That's it. That's okay. exactly, you said it perfectly. That's yeah. exactly what it is. And, uh, I th- it's, uh, it's, it's kind of wild to think how much, if I look back at, T- periods when I've been able to time block that way successfully, consistently, and by consistently, I mean even for two weeks, how much can get done if you set aside the equivalent of one movie oh, to yeah. single task <laughs> on one important thing? It's it's really remarkable, and I think that's a uh, perhaps a good segue to uh, the 
focusing question. Right? And this, mm-hmm. this is in uh, your book, The One Thing, which has come up yes. over and over and over again with uh, interviewees on this podcast, uh, particularly those uh, who are in the sort of growth phase and citing it as extremely important in the first, it's always important, I mean, this question, but the particularly important in the kind of make or break it years in the the, the, the first handful of years for entrepreneurs that I've interviewed on this Absolutely. podcast. Could you tell us about the folks in question, but perhaps how you got to the folks in question? You know, the um, so if we, if we just talk for a second about the focusing question, right? Which is, what's the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else is either easier or unnecessary. It's, it's, it's an understanding that you can't do two important things at the same time. You could, you could set definitely multitask, but the second that something really matters to you a lot, um, you don't multitask. You, 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 you hone in on that and you, you, you do that thing. Um, so the, 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 the idea of the focusing question is, are you present in the moment? Now, you don't do this every day, minute by minute, where you say, well, what's the most important thing I can do right now? What's the one thing I can do right now? What's the one thing I can do right now? But it is kind of a way of life, meaning that um, if you make your moments matter, right, matter as in you, you're appropriate in the right moment. Every, every, everything falls into place for you. So the whole idea behind the focusing question was <clears throat> to keep when it matters, when it's important to you, making sure that, that you're doing the priority right now that will lever your life, grow your life, expand your life. Right. And, and it's the, it's the idea that if you, you know, if two people are standing in the same spot, and one has a clear focus and understands the thing they need to be doing right now in order to get where they want to go, their, st- their next step is an appropriate step. For the individual who doesn't know what they should do, they're, they're most likely going to take the wrong step and then another wrong step and another wrong step. <clears throat> and over time, they're, they are worlds apart. So the, everything that we talk about from calendars to setting goals to creating plans, all of that. Is, is to is so that you get one thing, and that is in the moment right now, you're doing the thing that matters most, such that by doing it, what you're fixing to do next will either be easier or could turn out to be unnecessary. And uh, so, so I want to I comment on a few things here. First is for people who are maybe uh, in the in Portugal, listening to this, fixing to do something is getting ready to do it. And uh, <laughs> the uh, the second is uh, how powerful th- this question is, and how important the phrasing is. Uh, what's the one thing I could do such that by doing it, everything else would be easier or unnecessary? Because, and I and I'd, I'd I'd love to just hear you kind of riff on this, but. It, a lot of people listening to this, and I'll, I'll plead guilty myself also, very often end up with a to-do list, which is this sp- spontaneously generated, yep, uh, non-hierarchical, yep, brain splatter of yep tasks, yep, yep. and uh, you may then just proceed in a given day if you don't give any thought to it, to start knocking those off in order, top to bottom, even though they're not ordered in in terms of importance. And the such that it makes everything else uh, easier or unnecessary is the key, right? Because you're you're finding that lead domino that kind of knocks everything else over. Um, and, and that I'd love to, to hear maybe some of the results or effects that you've seen in, in your life as a result of, of using this or, or for your company for that matter. Um, mm-hmm. but like how do you suggest people use this? Do they think about it for the week and then set something to remind them on a, on a daily basis? Do you do it the, the night before and then write it down? What's the protocol for actually implementing this? Well, um, remember, it, and we said it in the title of the book, and that is the surprisingly simple truth behind extraordinary results. So this is, in my mind, <clears throat> the concept of the one thing is like adult Plato. 
it's 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 a ser- this is a a nuclear idea it it is a, a a an extraordinary idea in order to get extraordinary results if you're inappropriate in the moment the next moment you have not set up to succeed so you're behind right and so we have to be appropriate in our moments so and i i think i understand i have always understood that um Naturally, to be honest, uh, but I think at some point, and I couldn't pinpoint it, my I, I grabbed it as an idea and began to aim my life around that. And so simple ways to think about it is uh, I come home, I pull in the garage. What's the one thing I can do with my wife when I walk in the door such that by doing it, everything else for the rest of the night will be easier or unnecessary? And the answer is go find her and kiss her. That's the answer. And it's actually that simple. Uh, on a weekend, what's the one thing I can do such that by doing it, <clears throat> everything else would be easier or unnecessary? So the one thing is, is I wake up in the morning and make a quick list of things I need to do around the house. And I do that because I know that my wife um, is going to make a list for me. <laughs> and so the one thing I can do such that by doing it, my weekend is, is better, is to make that list and go knock it out. That's the right thing, right? The uh, My dog, what's the one thing I can do with my dog uh, in the morning such that by doing it, everything else is easier or unnecessary? By the way, the answer with our dog, Millie, is always the same. Get on the floor and hug her, right? That's what she wants. And as long as I do that, life is great. If I don't do that, well, everything else is is, is irrelevant to the dog. She, wants, she just wants me to love her. So I'm, I'm just giving you a variety of different ways, right? Um, what's the one thing I could do with my diet such that by doing it, everything else would be easier or unnecessary? What's the one thing I could do mm-hmm. that affects my cholesterol, affects my heart, affect, affects everything about me, right? And for me is the one thing is eat vegetarian. Mm-hmm. So that becomes the one thing for me. So I'm just giving you a variety of different no, of different ways of thinking no, about this. Those. Is a, and just to comment on the last one too, as uh, you know, eat vegetarian, and part of that I would imagine is setting up your environment so that you require less willpower, right? So you just get rid of exactly. anything that is not compliant with that that is in your house, exactly. whether you decide exactly. on vegetarian or something else. That makes everything else easier or unnecessary, like self control in looking at a box of whatever it is you're not supposed to eat that's staring you in the face when you open your refrigerator. Mm-hmm. So in business, it would go like it, a good example of using this would be <clears throat> in my business, who's the one person I could hire such that by hiring them, hiring other people would be unnecessary or easier. How have you, how, how might you have answered that for yourself in the past? Well, in, in 1994, I answered it by firing myself and hiring a CEO. Because I'm asking the question, what's the one thing I can do right now such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or unnecessary in growing the company? And the answer was fire myself and hire somebody better suited right now at that moment in history to do that. And then I asked the question, okay, so I understand hiring now is my one thing. Then the question becomes, who's the one person I can hire such that by hiring them, everything else becomes easier or necessary? So then I go on a hunt for that person who, when I hire them, I believe they can fulfill what I just said. Mm-hmm. It becomes the one hire, if, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. And, and uh, one – ast- go ahead. Same with technology, right? In, in, moving the, um, in moving the organization from being a company that buys technology to a company that builds its technology, which is the distinction between being a tech company and not, right? You can't be a – tech company we buy all our tech you're not a tech company tech company builds tech right so then the question becomes what's the one tech product you can build such that by building it everything else is easier or unnecessary and we play the game is uh so there's, there's a there's a line in the one thing that that i really like and i'd love to hear uh, how you think about it or how you suggest people, how you could elaborate on it, perhaps. A clear path to a lesser goal is the problem, yeah, is, is one of the lines that I have jotted down here. And uh, I mean, the way that I sort of interpret that is, uh, at least for myself personally, is that it's, it's not the sort of terrible ideas. It's not the 
uh, awful propositions and opportunities that are the problem past a certain point, and it, and it comes pretty early for a lot of folks and a lot of people listening, it's these sort of kind of cool, easy to commit to opportunities that are actually more threats and temptations than opportunities. Mm-hmm. They are the biggest threat to the one thing that you might decide if you ask that question that we've been talking about. Uh, is that the right way to think about a clear path to a lesser go being the problem? Mm-hmm. I think so. Yeah. I think that the, the, one of the things that I, I, um, I think it surprises people when they find out that I'm not focused all day long. That, in other words, my goal is to have a really great day by noon. And then if I, if I want to be distracted or can be distracted, that's fine. It doesn't really matter. I've already done everything that mattered. I've done the thing that mattered the most, mm-hmm. which is going to drive, right? Which is really, really is that it's kind of the cousin of the 80 20 rule, right? For sure. So that's all it is. And in the, in the way Jay and I described it in, in our book, we're just saying that, that the one thing is the 80-20 principle on steroids, right? Yeah. It's, on, it's, it's, on, it's a nuclear uh, way of looking at prioritizing and, yeah. and just distilling it. In. And, and the other side of that is, is that it all comes down to um, the fact that you have to live in the moment. Mm-hmm. So the question is, are you living appropriately or not? Mm-hmm. And then the other issue is, do you always have to do that? Do you always have to fight off distraction? And my response to that is, heck no. What, what you need to do is protect yourself. So, you know, uh, you need, I put forth this idea that the morning is the best time for you to deal with your energy. So I just recommend that, that people get up and have pretty much a set routine uh, when they get up in the morning to ensure that they get the key things in their personal life uh, nailed, that you then go to work and you you just do that work. What is the thing that's most important today and do that? And in the afternoon, if you still want to pursue lesser goals or other things, who cares? It's not going to impact your success. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be this 100% always on focus. Yeah, it's a huge relief. Uh, in respect, right? It's it's not like you have to maximize every minute of every day from Monday to Friday. Uh, yeah, that'd be horrible, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, it would be. That would be horrible. I mean, that would be. I don't even know how anybody would do that. I mean, yeah. it would it would be a horrible life. So the point is, is that <clears throat> we don't want to be. This is just me talking for me, but my life is better when I'm spontaneous after I've done my most important thing. That that being spontaneous before that, that's where it becomes a distraction and does me harm. So I'm free to pursue all kind of trivial pursuits um, after I've done what matters most because it, it just doesn't matter, right? It, yep. it is, if you like it and you want to do it, do it. It's not going to harm you because tomorrow morning you're going to wake back up and you're going to be focused again from the time you get up until about noon or whatever it is, whatever the, whatever time you get up, that six hours, that, that five and a half hours, wherever that is, that's, that's your power time. That's where, that's where you take over the world. Be great for the, that length of time and you're good to go. One of the most popular highlights, this is from Goodreads, uh, from the one thing is, Quote, work is a rubber ball. If you drop it, it will bounce back. The other four balls, family, health, friends, integrity, are made of glass. If you drop one of these, it will be uh, irrevocably scuffed, nicked, perhaps even shattered. That's right. And that alludes to the fact that there are categories of activities or, or, or different, I, I wouldn't say silos because they they certainly interact so much, but areas in your life where you can ask the focusing question, how do you think about ordering them if there is an order? That's a great question. Um, I kind of order it this way. Uh, I, I lump in there uh, spiritual, physical, right? Mental. I lump, I lump those into this category uh, and and my personal relationships, and I and I lump all of that into uh, one category. And my goal in the morning is to make sure that that works. In other words, that I get those things done. That's what ma- that's what matters most to me. Because if you know if you don't take care of your health, that's like a glass ball that shatters. 
It's, it's, it's hard to recover from that. Ignore your family too long and you'll lose your family. So, right. And, and so I, I kind of see spiritual, uh, mental, physical, uh, and, and key relationships as the most important things that, that matter to me, uh, in the morning so that I, you know, that I, I live by kind of a mantra that says, I don't want to die of, of regret. Right. I'd read, I, oh, I want to say on my deathbed, if I'm even coherent, that I'm glad I did not. I wish I had. Right. And right. Does that make sense? Makes perfect sense. So by the way, I played that game with my mom. She was a pistol after dad died and I kind of became the man in her life and she was a pistol. She was difficult at times. Mom, if you're hearing this, you were difficult. Um, and, um, but I loved, but I loved her dearly, but she was difficult. And so I had to play the game. I had to say, what's the one thing I can do with my mom says that by doing it, everything else is unnecessary because my mom would, would, I don't want to go into the details of all that, but, but she, you know, she could go off on tangents and do things and say things that could be hurtful and harmful. So I, I asked that question. And the one thing was um, play dominoes with my mother. Hmm. So uh, for the rest of her life, uh, with few exception, I, was, I, would go, I would go to lunch or uh, early dinner one day a week. And I would play dominoes with my mom. And you'd be surprised because what I number one, she loved it. Number two, it kept her preoccupied. She had to stay focused on trying to beat me instead of talking, <laughs> instead of instead of verbally beating me up. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then and then and then I, after I did that, that went so well, I said, OK, now what's the one thing I could do? Right. What's the next domino? And mother loved basketball. So I bought her the NBA channel every year. And made sure that she had the printed, laminated copy of the of the game schedule, uh, you know, with her right, right there by her easy chair, and uh, and then we made basketball the, the thing that we talked about because mm. if if we didn't talk about basketball, Tim, we were talking about my sisters or my spouse, uh, her sisters, in a negative, derogatory, gossipy way, just right. very destructive. And I just I just kept away from that with mom because I just played the game. What's the one thing I can do? What's the thing? What, what's the one activity? It's dominoes. What's the one thing we could talk about? Basketball, right? So that's kind of that's and to me that's the 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 that's just a another way of thinking about the one thing. I think that um, you know I'm embarrassed to admit I've I, it's so sensible and I've never applied this question exactly as you're describing it to individual people. It makes perfect sense and relationships with those people, but I've never totally. applied it. That's, uh, I think that's really, that'll be really powerful for a lot of people listening. Certainly I'm going to do it probably today or tomorrow. I'll sit down with the journal. Yeah. So the thing is like, uh, after I exercise, I asked the question, what's the one thing I could eat or drink such that by doing it, right? Everything else is easier, unnecessary. And I play that game. When do you exercise? What uh, what time of day? How many times of week? So I so I exercise uh, five days a week. I exercise um, uh, in the morning. So I get up, and by six thirty at the latest, my goal is to be in the gym. And um, so I do car I do my cardio right in my twenty to thirty minutes in my target heart rate zone. But I but I do. Uh, uh, you know, four minutes on and one minute slow, four minutes on, one minute slow, right? And I do that because the if, if, you, if you exercise at a steady pace, instead of doing the high uh, intensity interval training, HIIT, right, H-I-I-T, that the, the, the um, arteries, if you go at the same speed, your art, you're training your artery to be more, more brittle and rigid. But if you train your artery through high intensity interval training with cardio and weights, you're you're going fast then slow fast and slow and your and your artery is contracting expanding contracting expanding so when i when i get up i go right in there and i do my 20 to 30 minutes in my target heart rate zone and then i uh, move to weights and so we have a very specific schedule uh clarence bass is is kind of like my my physical hero do you know clarence i you know i know clarence not personally but only because i saw his black and white photographs in old 
you know, muscle and fitness magazines and so on. Oh, yeah. And I would always oh, yeah. think to myself, how on earth, because he had this like shiny, bald, bulbous head, kind of like I now, yeah. I now have. And I would think to myself, how on earth is that old guy so ripped? I mean, just <laughs> I <know. laughs> incredibly defined. So that's, that's I all I know of Clarence Bass. Well, that's his one thing, by the way. Uh, right. He was, he was a health and fitness. He still is health and fitness journalist, but he used his body as proof that what he was writing and talking about actually worked. Mm -hmm. But I only use it as an example that, um, I believe that we have the opportunity in life to choose our profits and most profits with a pH. Yeah. Yeah. And most people tend to think of that as religion only, but you could have a profit or you can call that a mentor or role model. I just call it a prophet, right? But you can have, you can, everyone should have the individual that is kind of their guru for those things, right? Who's your health guru? Who do you listen to? Who's lived before you, uh, right? And Jack LaLanne, just as an example, Jack LaLanne and Clarence Bass are two perfect examples. Gentlemen that uh, started bodybuilding or taking care, just taking care of their body <clears throat> uh, at a very young age when the thinking was one way. And as the thinking has changed over time, both of those men uh, changed the way they thought, right? Yeah. And Jack LaLanne was incredibly prescient. I mean, he oh, yeah. was so ahead of the curve on many things that then became mainstream and, and scientifically uh, oh, yeah. supported. It's, it's wild. Uh, also it's wild. quite a character, Eddie, where he would wear that kind of crazy onesie mm -hmm. jumpsuit and mm -hmm. uh he would mm -hmm. say sure you don't have to exercise but on the days you don't exercise you're not allowed to eat i mean very uncompromising which i appreciate he was awesome <laughs> yeah so he so <clears throat> so then let's ask that question so who's the one person that you could follow for your health such that by doing that following anyone else would be easier or unnecessary yeah yeah, that's great. So if you don't ask the focusing question around the people in your life, you'll end up following too many people. So again, how many how many profits do you need around health? Right? If you if you just follow Jack LaLanne, right, whose goal was to live to 100, <clears throat> what a loser he died at 96, right? But Clarence Bass has the same goal. So if you if you if you wanted to live to 100, just let's just pick that as a target. I want to live to at least a hundred. Then what's the one thing you could do that would make that easier or, or everything else easier or not necessary? In my mind, it would be go follow, go find the person that, ha that exemplifies that better than anyone else and make that one person your true North. What's fun. You can, it, you can even go, you could then go dive into the Jack LaLanne approach or the Clarence Bass approach or whoever is your prophet for health. And you would, you would, you could then distill down what they do right into one thing, believe it or not. And you could also, uh, this is something that I do in a, in a few areas. Just ask yourself, for instance, my friend, Matt Mullenweg is one of the calmest people under fire. I've, ever witnessed in any capacity of any age. He's a young guy, but uh, incredibly calm when making high stakes decisions or, or facing tough circumstances. And I tend not to be that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I yeah. mean, I, I think I'm reasonably calm, but I also, uh, as, as my mom would say, patience has never been your strong suit. Uh, so, <laughs> and uh, so I will ask when I feel myself getting spun up sometimes, uh, upset against, uh, upset about something that I know in many cases is trivial. I'll just ask myself, what would Matt do? What yeah, would Matt do? exactly. And you can do that for yes. Jack Lane or whoever you choose. And it's, if you have seven people as your true North, you don't have a true North, right? It's, That's right. it's scattered That's right. and it's, you really need, at least I do that specific person, that image. And guess what? If it doesn't cover a hundred percent of all decisions, who cares? Is it as long as you have one who helps you to navigate the majority of decisions, you're far better off. Yes, that's it. I couldn't have said it better. That is exactly right. The, and people tend to not understand that that actually is, is life affirming. It's life expanding. It, it's, it's the, it's really the, if you want to live the biggest life possible, then ask big questions of yourself, right? And go and go find individuals who in fact have, have, they're doing that thing that matters to you. Not that, not that I know what Jack LaLanne's morals were or anything like that. I don't need to know because I'm not saying he's my prophet in morals. I'm simply saying he's my prophet around health. And we, we've been discussing up to this point primarily how to say yes to the right things. And uh, it's, it's not 
necessarily a long list, but how to hone in and say yes to the right things. Do you say uh, no categorically to anything across the board? Uh, are there any decisions that you've made along the lines of, I'm not going to do X? And I'll, I'll give you a personal example just because uh, I find it uh, incredible how st- stress removing these things, these types of categorical decisions have been for me. So I I used to stress about, uh, this is probably 2008, 2009, speaking engagements. I didn't particularly enjoy speaking engagements generally. Sometimes I did. And I found myself traveling all over the place. It was similar to your travel schedule, right? The four days a week, like one day in Houston, one day in San Antonio, et cetera. And uh, furthermore, because I didn't have any strict policies, because I never expected to be invited to speak, Uh, before the first book, I found myself uh, and my assistants constantly negotiating one-off deals. And then one of my friends said to me, who who does next to no public appearances, he said, yeah, I have a simple rule. I either do do full retail, I never negotiate, they pay my list price, or it's a a, a no-go, or I do unpaid for groups and causes I care about. He said, I do nothing in between. I never negotiate. And if, and he said, if someone pays me a, 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 an absurdly high rate, that becomes my new high watermark, right? Like that becomes the new retail <laughs> price. And I remember coming away from the call thinking that is so simple and so profound. And I implemented that and it just removed this gigantic energy suck for me. And so I've started to make more rules like that, right? And uh, I'm curious if you have anything you categorically just decline. Pretty much everything. (laughs) No, I, I know. I know it sounds a little weird to say that, but if the people around me would probably confirm that. Yeah. That essentially... Uh, anything that's a distraction or anything that interferes with, with what I, what I deem is, is, uh, my path or my relationships or whatever. I just say no. I mean, I literally, I am, I am, I am a definite no person, right? Uh, time is a big issue for me and we have a limited amount of it. And so saying no to talking to people is right. I, I have this saying in my head that, that says that people that work with me are more important than people that don't. Mm-hmm. And so I, the fact that you and I are talking right now, my team will tell you that you must really love Tim. <laughs> well, I appreciate you making the time because I would, I say no to everyone. This is, this is the only one I've done. And I just say no to everybody categorically. No. And the reason is because when I woke up this morning, <clears throat> Uh, talking to that individual was not on my game plan. So at the end of the day, if talking to that person, if I have a spare moment and it's a kindness I can do, love to do that, love to do that. But given my life and how big it is, <clears throat> there, aren't many, there aren't many of those moments, you know, because I look up and I go, hold on, I have a spare minute. I need to go hug my wife again. I mean, that's the way I think about it. I need to, I need to go hang out with my dog more, right? I need to go do whatever that is within my, my list or at least within my focus categories of the things that matter most to me. So I'm, I'm a very much a no man. I just say it over and over and over and over and over again. Do you have any preferred or default language that you, that you like to use or that you tend to use? How, how do you convey <laughs> that to people? And let, let's, let's assume it's not, you know, Joe Blow from Muckety Muck Incorporated, who is just a random inbound, because I'm imagining you have filters for that type of thing. And even if you didn't, you would just ignore it. Uh, but let's say uh, an old friend you've kind of drifted away from manages to somehow get a hold of you and invites you to be on the such and such board of some type. And you're like, ah, you know, and you listen to the, your A, it's not on your list. B, you don't really want to do it, doesn't feel good. Uh, what do you what do you say? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly direct about it, <clears throat> but I'm, I, I believe in the love, tough love sandwich approach, right? So, you know, I say, Hey Tim, typically this is in a text or an email, right? Because I don't, I, I don't allow people to talk to me, uh, get to me via a phone or standing in front of me 
because that that then becomes awkward. And now I have to deal with it on their time schedule instead of mine, which throws my schedule off, throws my focus off or throat right. So my standard line is, <clears throat> you know, hey, Tim, this is me typing at something. And it says, hey, Tim, I really appreciate you thinking about me. Um, to be honest with you, I would love to say yes. But the problem is, and I have several scripts after this. Problem is, if I say yes to you, I have to say yes to other people. And because I don't have time to say yes to everybody, I have to say no to everybody. And I, 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 I'm so sorry, uh, but um, I just can't do this. Um, good luck. <laughs> I mean, or, or here's so, I, <clears throat> have you tried Tim Ferriss? You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll, I'll definitely, you know, if there's, some, if there's someone else. But that's kind of a standard line for me. Yeah. My, my line is, you were looking for a script, and the, yeah. the, the underlying script would be, I can't say yes to everybody, so I'm going to have to say no. Yeah. Yeah, because I get those requests. I get them every day. They, they, they just fly at me. Same with you. I mean, it, yeah, I do. We get it. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm asking partially because I want to borrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the other line that yeah. I give, and it's totally true, by the way, is and that is I, I plan my time months, even years in advance. Now, understand I can always erase. So yep. it's, I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm not a rigid person at all about that. But my one of my standard scripts is. I'm so sorry, I, I can't do that. I plan my time, uh, you know, years, a year in advance, years in advance. And um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm booked then. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I'm, remember, I'm the guy that when they um, recognized me as the second person ever recognized from my high school, I didn't go to the awards. When, they, when, they, when, when I graduated from college, I just drove out of town. I didn't even go to the graduation when they named me the most, uh, the, what was the uh, the in, most influential person of the year uh, two years ago? I didn't go to the convention to get my award. When they when when uh, Austin um, recognized me as the entrepreneur of the year, I didn't go to the ceremony. So, all right, I have to pause. These are great. Uh, how? What is and is the line? I'm sorry, I. I have I plan years and months out in advance. Do you remember specifically what you conveyed to these folks or had your assistants convey? On which one? Any of them. Oh, that's that, that's exactly right. That, that no, that's, that's the line. And so sorry, he, his schedule uh, conflicts with your date, so he will not be able to attend. Now, we then offer up somebody else if they want to go. So for entrepreneur of the year, um, one of my partners went. And it was so funny because um, the, I think that was the same year that John Mackey of Whole Foods was recognized. He and I were co-recognized. And after – so she got up and she spoke about me, right? It's really hard for – you know, if you win an award to go in and say, I'm awesome, I'm great, I'm terrific, I'm all these things, because that would look stupid, right? Right. But if you send a proxy, the proxy stands up and says, I want to tell you about my dear friend Gary Keller. He's the most amazing guy I've ever met. I want to tell you a story that exemplifies just a wonderful guy he is, right? And apparently, yeah. So oh, people, wow. So so I've heard this more than once where they'll come off the stage and the person, whoever they were with, goes, I'm going to get a proxy next time. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the most genius workarounds I think I've I've heard in a very 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 long time. Hey, just uh, put that down as one of your time hacks, man. I will. That's, I will. That's, that's that's how you do it. Oh and it my works, god! It works it's, really well, man. That it is genius. It. So yeah. genius. Uh, well, I know we only have just a, a handful of minutes left, and uh, then I want to let you get back to hugging your wife and wrestling mm -hmm. with your dog and doing all the other things that you know that have to do today uh, on, on, a, on a business level. Uh, I'd like to ask a question that I, that I ask pretty often, and uh, that is the billboard question. So if you could put a, a quote, a message, a question, anything on a billboard, metaphorically speaking, to get a, a message of some type out to billions of people, let's say, uh, something non-commercial. Uh, what what might you put on the billboard? Think big, aim high. Think big, aim high. Why is thinking big important to you? It's a theme that runs through a lot of your writing. Um, 
Warren Buffett said it really well when he said that uh, the, the habits of our life are like chains that are too loose to be noticed until they're too tight to break. And when you think about our life being built upon habits, <clears throat> you realize that most people accrue habits instead of form good ones. And so when you think when you think big and you aim high and you start running towards that, you have to develop big habits, scalable habits in order to implement that plan. So if you if you didn't say think big and aim high, what would you say? Think small? Would you think think low? Would you say think average? Well, if you didn't say think big, what what are the other choices? And most people by default, because they don't, they don't think big, they don't aim high, they end up developing very average or below average habits. They end up develop right? Their, their, your thinking leads to action. Action over time becomes a habit. So if I'm thinking small, then I'm forming small habits. And here's the problem, like Warren Buffett said. Now, my, now, now I'm a person of small habits. And all of a sudden I look up and I go, wow, I really, I really do want more out of, out of my life. And then you have to go break these habits, and that's really hard to do, whether they're eating habits or exercising habits or you name it, work habits or relationship habits. It doesn't really matter that, you know, at the end of the day, the, if you have a choice, think big. If, if you have a choice, aim high and then ask yourself, what do I need to do to do that? And what are the habits or what's the one habit I need to develop such that by doing it, everything else is easier and necessary and go get that habit. But if you don't think big, what's your choice, right? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like the joke I tell the kids. I say, so think of it this way. So you, you fall in love with someone and you want to ask them to marry you. And you go, um, will you marry me? I, I've dreamed of our life together and it's going to be average. We're going to live an average life and live in an average home, drive an average car, eat average food, uh, take average vacations, read average books, go to average movies. We'll have average friends. We'll have average parties. Uh, and if we have kids, we'll have average kids and we'll teach them you know, the virtues of being average. <laughs> right? Let's get married. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> I don't think anybody does that, do they? <laughs> Not purposely. Not purposely. And but, you and I, but what you and I both know is that if you don't choose your life, if you don't choose the direction of your life, you'll you'll go in any direction. You'll end up in places that you didn't want to be at because you didn't choose where you wanted to be. So think big, aim height. I'd put that on the billboard. Yeah, and uh, and I want to also note that. You made a very deliberate decision to look at and change your habits long ago when uh, when you noticed that you were on this linear incremental path that maybe was in some ways just kind of reacting to whatever was in front of you or whatever was expected to be the next step. You you were able to redirect that crucial handful of degrees that over the long term is not a few feet. It's not a hundred feet. It's you know thousands of miles in terms of uh, the difference between where you could have ended up and where you did end up. Right. So it's uh, it's a very inspiring story. You know, one of the things that I ultimately developed was the the habit of being able to develop a habit, because in the end, uh, that that singular skill uh, becomes like your superpower. Right. The ability to to just call it the, the habit hack, if you will. <laughs> but it's the ability to form a habit. And it's hard. It's not easy. It's really hard. I'm 62 years old. It takes time to develop the ability to say, I want that. And I now see the singular habit that will get me there. I'm now going to develop that habit. Uh, aside from deciding on the habit, as you just mentioned, have you found anything in particular to help you to develop or stick with new habits? Mm -hmm. Other people. Uh, go right. Your support system. It's, it's the phrase that I used earlier, and that is your, your environment has to support your goal. So your environment has to support your habit, too. So you, you literally, if you want to form a new habit, you're going to have to have your environment support that. You're going to have to have the people around you cheering for you and supporting you to do that, right? I had a, uh, Mary had an aunt uh, who passed away a few years ago. She's a wonderful, wonderful woman. And, um, but she was the size 
of, of, I don't know how to say it. She was massive and she was massive. And, and her husband, by the way, was Jack Spratt. And in getting to know that family, what I came to understand, I don't know was, who that is. Who's that? Oh, the skinny guy. So, uh, was, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Jack Spratt knew no fat, right? The, uh, yeah, he, this is there's a skinny, 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 skinny man, and uh, his thing was, uh, you know, uh, dear, you can go pursue anything you want around health, as long as the kids and I have three square meals and ready for us, and they have to be different meals. And again, she, 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 she cooked, she cooked for them, and she couldn't help herself. She had to taste it, and then she had to eat it. And given her body type and the way she was, for him it didn't affect him. For her, it completely blew her up. And it was, and, and it, you know, once you realize that, you go, oh "My gosh, your environment has to support your goal." That so to me that 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 the habit hack is go find somebody or a group of people that will support you, and then build that support mechanism, right. Make sure that your spouse or significant other or best friend or whoever, make sure that they're, they're in alignment, right? Tell them what your goal is. Don't hide it. I want to do this. I need your help. Give me permission. I give you permission to, to help support me to do that. It's the secret. Good right? advice. Yeah. It's so critical. Yeah. Don't, don't rely on being the best captain in rough seas that you manufacture yourself. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> set, set, set your conditions. Uh, I've just, uh, just, just perhaps two or three questions uh, left. One, I, I have to ask because I don't know the answer. Why, why uh, do this interview? I know you're a busy guy, and you just mentioned you do very little media. So why, why do the podcast? You know, because I really like and respect you. To be honest with you, and you do a lot of good. You know, when your first book came out. I'll be honest with you. I looked at the title and went, that guy's full of it. Then I read the book and then went, oh my gosh, this is a significant book. This is not a trivial book. Uh, he has a cool title, but to be honest with you, <clears throat> what you wrote, everyone should read. And I firmly believe that. And um, so to be honest with you, I'm, I'm just here to honor you. It's Thank an you, honor Gary. that you would ask. It's, it's an honor that you would ask me, but more importantly, just the ability for you and I just to talk for a couple hours um, is is a thrill for me, and I just want to be supportive. Well, I really appreciate that, and uh, I I want to give uh, give you. Uh, I want to give us time for me to disappoint. <laughs> so hopefully we'll be able to <laughs> grab a cup of coffee uh, or, or break some bread back, we'll in, back in Austin. And uh, this has been really fun. I really yeah, appreciate it. it. And, and valuable. I took tons of notes. I have four pieces of paper in front of me with notes scribbled all over them that I'm going <laughs> to uh -oh. clean up afterwards. Good notes. And uh, is, is there anything else you'd like to say or suggest, mention, uh, websites, social, anything like that. Of course, I'll link to all of that in the show notes, so people will have that on the website and via email either way. But is there any anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up? You know, I, um, if you mentioned sending people to some places, so I, I just started, uh, Jay and I started our new podcast called Think Like a CEO. And um, so, yeah, telling people to, to come and, and check us out and see if that's a cool place to go learn would be awesome. Perfect. We'll we'll send some we'll send some some traffic. So we will put think like a CEO the link to the podcast. Uh, we will put links to the books and certainly uh, the, the company and many other resources in the show notes. So everybody listening, those will be available as always at tim blog forward slash podcast. Uh, and uh, Gary, thank you so much for for taking You're the welcome, time, Tim. It was a blast, my friend. Thank you. And to everybody out there with earphones in or otherwise, thank you for listening. Hey guys, this is Tim again. Just a few more things before you take off. Number one, this is Five Bullet Friday. Do you want to get a short email from me? And would you enjoy getting a short email from me every Friday that provides a little morsel of fun for the weekend? And Five Bullet Friday is a very short email where I share the coolest things I've found or that I've been pondering over the week. That could include favorite new albums that I've discovered. It could include gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of weird shit that I've somehow dug up. 
in the uh, the world of the esoteric as I do. It could include favorite articles that I've read and that I've shared with my close friends, for instance. And it's very short. It's just a little tiny bite of goodness before you head off for the weekend. So if you want to receive that, check it out. Just go to fourhourworkweek.com. That's fourhourworkweek.com, all spelled out. And just drop in your email, and you will get the very next one. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by Ring. This season can be a whirlwind of deliveries, visitors, and holiday travel. So it's the best time of the year to upgrade your doorbell and keep an eye on home, no matter where the holidays take you. I'm traveling a ton, and this is key for me. Ring helps you stay connected to your home from anywhere. So if there's a package delivery or a surprise visitor, you'll get an alert and be able to see, hear, and speak to them all from your phone. If you're on the go this season, whether it's across town or across the country, you can check in anytime for some much needed holiday peace of mind. I personally used Ring for years now. It catches and records all the regular stuff, like deliveries and so on, but it's also saved my ass a few times catching weirdos and weird things. Ring is key to my peace of mind. And as a listener of The Tim Ferriss Show, that's you, you have a special holiday offer on a Ring Welcome Kit available right now. With the Ring Video Doorbell 2 and Chime Pro, the Ring Welcome Kit has everything you need to keep an eye on home no matter what this holiday season brings. With Ring, you're always home. Just go to ring.com forward slash Tim. That's ring.com forward slash Tim. Check it out. Additional terms may apply, and this offer is for U.S. residents only. That is ring.com forward slash Tim. This episode is brought to you by ShipStation. If you've ever sold anything online or if you sell anything online, then you know what a pain in the ass the shipping process is. It's time consuming, it's expensive, you're always copying and pasting orders from different sites, trying to figure out the best carrier, so on and so forth. It's such a hassle. And in a previous life, I shipped tens of thousands of units overseas, domestically, overnight, ground, every possible carrier. It drove me bonkers. ShipStation was created to make your life easier. I wish I had had it when I was in the biz, so to speak. It has the most five-star reviews of any shipping software. 4.9 out of 5 for Magento users, 4.8 out of 5 for Shopify users, 4.5 out of 5 for big commerce users. It goes on and on. Whether you're selling on eBay, Amazon, Shopify, or more than 100 other popular selling channels, ShipStation lets you access all of your orders from one simple dashboard. ShipStation works with all of the major shipping carriers locally and globally, including FedEx, UPS, and the major local couriers like USPS. ShipStation will recommend the best carrier for your needs so that you know that you're always getting the best deal. They even offer discounts on shipping costs that are available to say you as a one person shop that would normally be thought of as reserved for large Fortune 500 companies. So there are a lot of benefits. No other shipping platform makes shipping faster, easier, and more affordable. And right now, Tim Ferriss Show listeners get to try ShipStation free for 60 days when you use promo code TIM. It's risk-free. You can start your free trial without even entering your credit card info. Just visit ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in TIM, T-I-M. That's ShipStation.com. Enter promo code TIM. Check it out, ShipStation.com. Promo code 